Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Gorecon, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives after they put out important news. Important news today, that's an understatement. With us is Yaron Conforti, CEO, co-founder, Novamind, trades on the CSC under the stock symbol NM, and for our friends in the U.S., NVMDF. For those who are new to the story, to understand Novamind, you first have to understand that the psychedelics uh, industry is going to go through a, what I call a parabolic paradigm shifting growth phase in the next five years because of their ability to treat anxiety and depression amongst other things. But Novamind is a leading mental health company specialized in, psycho, in psychedelic medicine and they're building what we call the infrastructure required for a regulated psychedelics industry because we think that's coming. More than just lip service though, because a lot of companies like to use psychedelics as a buzz phrase. They've got a, a rapidly expanding network of outpatient mental health clinics, four in Utah, uh, another one anticipated this quarter, the, over 20,000 visits in 2020, up over 100, uh, 100%, all sorts of stats. The numbers, $1.28 million in revenue for the quarter ended December 31st. For the six months ended, $2.1 million. And more than just clinics, they also do research and retreat networks. Today's press release, Novamind partners with Merck, the Merck for new treatment resistant depression trial. You're on. Welcome to the show. Thanks, George. Good to be here. Hey, congratulations on this, first of all, because uh, Merck is a $200 billion company with $50 billion, just under $50 billion in revenues. Uh, before we get into like the details of this of this press release, how does that feel to have that kind of third party validation that Merck came knocking on your doors and said, partner with us here on this uh, on this trial feels great and, and i'm not going to be uh bashful about it at all uh the real credit again i, I sort of recognizing my role I'm, I'm the ceo of the company and the founder of Novamind, but my partner in the business is our chief medical officer dr reed robison so the real congratulations go to him um you know it's newsworthy of course for everybody we're very excited to share it but it's, uh, it's a product of Reed's work for decades now. So for some of the people familiar with the company, they'll know that Reed also led the trials for uh, a Janssen drug called Spravato, uh, yep. which is a very significant uh, drug using ketamine, which is psychedelic medicine, in fact. So this is, uh, let's say, a string of accomplishments that date back uh, a couple of decades now and include, of course, him being involved in the MAPS MDMA trials. So it's, uh, I would say it, it validates for sure and for people who, who, who either didn't do the due diligence or, or wouldn't have taken the time to do the due diligence, you know, recognizing that someone like Merck um, is giving us a, a key site in a clinical trial, uh, phase two for, for a new treatment resistant uh, depression drug candidate is, uh, is that validation. So I, I hope obviously a lot of people understand it now. I think, I think it's almost too good to be true, but they're, they're definitely getting it. So let's talk about this. Uh, you know, Merck is a one of the uh, one of the top. They're top five for sure, if not the top uh, in the world. Why did they choose? Why did they choose Novamind for this for this uh, new treatment resistant depression depression trial? I'm, you know, I'm going to give you a, a two word answer, um, and it may sound ambiguous, but it's it's very real. It's thought leadership, and you know, people use the term. I think people in psychedelic medicine are looking to establish that thought leadership. You know, we're excited for all participants to be clear. We don't want to take a, a sort of, there's no scarcity view of this industry. Um, if people have that thought leadership and capability and can bring it, you know, use it to bring new therapies, particularly psychedelic medicines to market, we're very supportive of that. In our case, again, with Reed as our partner, that thought leadership has been demonstrated for many years. So. I think as you see Clearly, the, the very large drug companies um, getting involved in the, the phase drug development to bring new therapies to market, you know, people have to recognize that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not only the newly established companies that maybe they're very familiar with as media, but it should be obvious if, if it isn't now um, that the largest balance sheets in the world are, are going to get involved. You know, our involvement, again, to be specific about it, um, it comes down to clinical research sites. And in these clinical research sites for these therapies are, are sometimes and oftentimes very different from typical clinical research sites. So that infrastructure is different. The 
protocols that you're using, the length, the duration um, of the treatments and the specialized therapeutic components of those treatments, that, that's the thought leadership, right? To go from ambiguous to very specific. So to be recognized, again, not only as a site, not only by Merck, but in a, in a, a, um, in a phase development for a treatment resistant depression drug, it's really exciting and it's exactly evidence of the impact we want to have. What's the role you guys are playing? Uh, I know you got into a little bit of specifics there, but maybe are you able to give us a little more specifics in how this trial is going to go and what, what role Nova Mind is going to play in it? Sure. The, you know, the role, again, and for people who are new to Nova Mind, what we're talking about now is a very uh, important and specific component of Nova Mind. And that is um, within NovaMind, it's called Cedar Clinical Research. It's 100% owned by NovaMind. And it focuses on um, drug development. It, CRO, the acronym is Contract Research Organization, and people can think of it as a clinical research organization. That means that when drug developers want to develop drugs, they, they go to providers like ours and those people that have experience in that class of drugs, in this case, uh, CNS. And, um, it starts in some cases with trial design. Uh, you, you, you design a trial, you recruit patients for a trial, you run those trials, and then you provide the data to the drug developers. And when you get to phase three, you have thousands of these sites worldwide before a drug comes to market. And that's, for example, what, what MAPS uh, is, is doing foundational work in phase three with, uh, with that you know, scale of, of sites in their trial. Um, so in this case with Merck, of course, the, the trial design, uh, they have their own capabilities. So to break it down for you, uh, recruiting's already started. We have a very good capability uh, in the U.S. of recruiting the, the right candidates for these trials. So we'll be recruiting our own pool of candidates. And then and that's because we'll the clinic that. side probably too, right? That you, that, that exactly right. you got the clinic side? That's exactly right. So, you know, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll use that as a segue, but to, to put a wrap on your question, we serve drug developers like Merck. Uh, we also serve, I, I mentioned some of the others, Janssen, Otsuka is another large pharma. We also small, serve smaller groups, including not-for-profits like the Ketamine Research Foundation. Uh, and of course, MAPS being a not-for-profit, which you know, most industry participants are, are building on the shoulders on, on the work that they're doing and have done. Um, and Reed, of course, being a coordinating investigator in the MDMA trial. So, it's a spectrum of clients working on everything from uh, MDMA and psilocybin to next generation drugs through Merck. And the other component of our clinical research platform actually develops um, a very particular part of the IP value chain. We develop that in-house. So as I mentioned, we're serving drug developers. We're not a drug developer ourselves. Of course. Uh, what we do do is we develop therapeutic protocols. And that means that um, things like MDMA and psilocybin that have gone through FDA phase three approvals have much of the safety and efficacy data uh, that people require to develop protocols attached to those compounds. So the work that we do is using our clinical research expertise gained from things like this Merck engagement and others. And we're designing the protocols to go with those compounds like psilocybin and MDMA and focusing on very specific indications. Uh, examples would be eating disorders. Another example would be end of life uh, distress, so palliative care. And there's others I could give, but if you can now imagine that CCR, Cedar Clinical Research, the same entity that is trusted by Merck, uh, has its own uh, uh, senior research clinicians um, with decades of experience doing just this, designing protocols for indications where drugs don't exist. An example again would be eating disorders. So there are no drugs you can take. Uh, if you're suffering from anorexia and we were working in real time on bringing a protocol using some of those compounds that I, I mentioned previously to treat that disorder specifically. So a um, bit more insight into what Cedar Clinical Research is. And again, uh, really the congratulations to Dr. Robison and his team. Um, we're, we're, we're really proud of it. Uh, With, uh, maybe I'll go to clinics, but if you have anything else that you want to know about the CRO, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, well, yeah. what I was going to ask was, uh, I can almost feel shareholders asking, right? I can feel it, even though I need a flux capacity going in the future because we're taping this by tape delay, but they're probably thinking, and because I'm thinking it, so what does this mean as shareholders? We love the work. Obviously, it's a substantial, unbelievable tier one partner. Uh, what does that mean in terms of, how much can you talk to us about what it means in terms of revenue? How big is this? And not just today, but I also want to quote Dr. Robeson, who said, 
This exciting research opportunity with Merck exemplifies a growing pipeline of opportunities for us to provide contract research services to leading drug developers. So what does what does a, a trial like this typically mean in terms of revenue for the company? And what does the pipeline look like? Because clearly there's a pipeline uh, and, and leading drug developers trust you. So maybe we can talk to both of those as, as much as you can shed light on it. Sure. I mean, I mean, you know, last question first is really, I, I think I can answer it in total is that, um, you know, we've only been public for two months, two, two and a bit now, I should say. Um, you know, there's, there's things that we can talk about, things we can't. So in terms of talking about the pipeline of things and, and, and dealing with selective disclosure, it's something we're, we're pretty tight about. Of course, again, we, we didn't just start this business. Um, the thought leadership was already there with Reed and the knowledge from the drug development peers was there. Um, I'll, I'll say that, you know, we are, we're also talking to a lot of the drug developers. If you, if you look at the capital markets now, you know, most of the capital that's flowing into the space is flowing those drug developers. So they, of course, need the help. And um, that, that actually starts with regulatory, not necessarily clinical, because there's also a lot of um, uh, functional, uh, let's say, product producers that also want to come to market. So there's a regulatory component there, a clinical component there. Um, the pipeline's exciting, and, and you'll definitely see more uh, similar, uh, let's say, trials and, and arm's length relationships. You'll also see examples where there was uh, about a month ago with Bionomics, which is another clinical trial that we're currently being evaluated for as a host site um, uh, for that trial. Now it's with Bionomics, uh, an Australian listed company that's listed, potential uh, listed in Australia, that's developing a drug therapy candidate for PTSD. Uh, are you able to give us, um, as, and maybe not specific to this one with Merck, but in general, if George Com, uh, one of the top five pharmaceutical companies in the world comes to you tomorrow for something similar to this, what kind? What's the financial benefit to, to shareholders? If you're able to- Yeah, sorry, I was, I was giving you the pitch first and the specs later. And, and yeah, I, actually I can be pretty specific about it. I okay. didn't mean to be evasive. Uh, specifically, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the scale of Merck. You know, th this agreement is um, it's close to half a million dollars, wow. uh, US dollars, of course, of business for us. And that could scale up. So it's it's pretty significant uh, piece of business. Again, you're talking about uh, these trials happen over an extended period of time as I mentioned before, recruiting phase and, and the rest. So it's, it's a little bit lumpy in there, but uh, that's, that's the sort of the range. Um, and it's, it's a good, uh, it's a profitable business, meaning the margin uh, on the business is high. And uh, so happy to, you know, give you a specific about that, but it, you know, it, it comes down to also the, of course, you know, clients like Merck who are, are well-established and have huge budgets towards this, we're as interested in working with the clients that are, are really at a, maybe a much more novel uh, molecule level or, or whatever they're working with in, in the case of trial design. Um, and in fact, the revenue may, may not be as significant on the front end, but we might be able to play an even bigger role in influencing these, these drugs towards their path to market. So, you know, we, we really do serve a wide spectrum of people uh, in the CRO business. Um, before we go further, what I like, what during my intro, I said, Nova Mind's got three pillars. The clinical care, which we talked about extensively, you've got the clinics, grow 20,000 patients visits last year in 2020, growing by 100%. But, you know, has a feel, it's, must, it's great for shareholders to know that you've also got the research side, because this would go into the research side of your pillars, right? So you've got the clinics going really well, you got the research side going really well, clearly with an, an announcement like this, and, and with Dr. Robeson talk about a growing pipeline of opportunity. So, you know, how do you feel today about the future of the company and, and its stability foundation and, you know, relevance within the industry? Because obviously if Merck knows you, everybody knows you. Uh, you know, my, my conviction grows um, more and more every day. And uh, today, obviously, and, and to have it, as I said, validated and you can, you can only drink the Kool-Aid so much. You, you need that feedback loop. And, and I don't want to live uh, in, in, in an echo chamber that way. So, you know, it, it, it resonates. People understand that our, it's more than a mission. It's, it's an ethos for the company. And it's, it's very difficult, even with the momentum around mental health. So in essence, we're trying to normalize mental health. And we're trying to normalize uh, access to the curated treatments that people can have that, that are going to change their lives. Now, 
again, I want to point out that ours is an operating model for, for psychedelic medicine and for innovative mental health care. So um, we are operating the clinic network that we operate under the Cedar Psychiatry brand really successfully today. There's four of them, and we're going to be expanding them across the U.S., and, and you'll hear some news on that soon. What I mean by, by normalizing um, is that when, when you have therapeutic protocols that are tailored specifically to you know, particular mental health, dis mental health disorders, um, and that's something, again, that I've described, and we've spent most of this uh, time talking about the CRO, and again, coming on a day like today makes sense. So that CRO, CRO Clinic, brings those things to market, whether we design a protocol or we help a, a drug candidate like Merck. But the, the, the person suffering, the, the loved ones that people have and the people that we know, um, aren't positioned to access the drugs, obviously, through clinical trials. That's a very small group of people, right? Very, very small group of yeah. people yeah. compared to what needs to help. Um, it's roughly 80 million that, that are suffering from treatment-resistant depression as one example. So it becomes about access points. It's not just normalizing the, the, the service, if you will, but it's how people access and interact with it. And um, you know, to sum it up, and I've said this before, if, if people have heard me speak, there is a symbiotic relationship between our clinics and our and Cedar Clinical Research, our clinical research organization, because the ability to contribute to the development of these drugs and be positioned as soon as they're legal to provide the highest standard of care because we were so closely involved in clinical trials because reminding people again, you need trained therapists, you need a certain kind of infrastructure. Um, these are not um, um, the type of transformations that come from disassociative experiences need a, a very particular environment. And that's what you see, for example, when we're preparing, very much preparing for a world where MDMA is legal prescription in 2023 you'll see specific um, requirements in those regulations, including the number of therapists, the size of the rooms, access to bathrooms, things like that. So normalizing mental health care, again, for, for us and our contribution to it, is to take an agnostic view of the therapies that are coming to market to say that not all compounds and therapeutics work the same way for all people, for the same indications. So that, for example, is why at our clinics today, they don't just provide ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, KAP is the common acronym, but there's also things like Spravato, uh, which is a, a prescription form of ketamine, um, like TMS, transcranial magnetic, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And, and these are, again, innovative modalities, not well known by a lot of people. And even for the people that, that they are well known um, to, the, the modalities themselves, not easily accessible. So that is, they don't know, uh, or maybe there doesn't exist yet a Nova Mind clinic near them. So there isn't one place they can go to access all these therapies, right, administered by experts. Uh, and this is what we mean by normalizing. So our accomplishments in the clinic and, excuse me, in, in the clinical research group and our ability to bring those things to market, provide them to our clients so that if, if Reed or any of our other clinicians that he trains is dealing with someone today in real time, reminding your, your, uh, your audience that we had 20,000 clients, client visits last year. So the, the way that works is that they give a, a range, a spectrum of modalities to people to both uh, understand and to match with their particular disorder. So this is the model that works today. It sounds maybe futuristic to some people because they've never interacted. Well, it's with new, it's new right? right? So yeah, it definitely new. sounds futuristic, but listen, that's the job of investors to wrap their mind around it to, to understand what's coming. Uh, can I read into that? You know how you're saying that uh, access is still an issue. So does that mean that uh, right now you're heavily focused more in Utah, right? Uh, do you see more clinics, uh, you know, around the country? Uh, so that so that whether you're Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, Central, you know, uh, Central USA, you can be you, you can get to a Nova Mind clinic uh, without having to travel across the country. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the approach. The accessibility, both uh, geographically and in, from, a, from a price point as well, it's, it's embedded in, in our business now and how we operate our clinics that you know, we, we don't want to marginalize people that can't afford certain treatments. So we, we, have, we have a particular effort towards that. Uh, what, when it comes down to opening locations, the, the goal right now is to expand very quickly across the US. And in fact, that's why we went public. So we raised right. um, our capital prior to going public. We, we haven't tapped the capital markets yet. And, and we've done all that essentially on our own. Our decision to go public 
was knowing that if in fact you wanna build a clinic network to the dozens of clinics that, that we wanna build, um, you know, you're gonna need it in the order of, of tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars and pretty quickly. So what that looks like is that there's priority states, there's places like Denver and there's places, there's states like Oregon that we prioritize uh, and people will see as we expand, but it's, you, you expand a clinic platform, you know, with a couple of, the fuel is capital, as I mentioned, um, we don't need to buy real estate. So, you know, to start a new clinic for us is uh, about $250,000 in the US and you can acquire them, right? That's the other way. So we have a, a pretty good pipeline and we've recently added a head of the uh, M&A, if you look at our news flow, uh, someone who's very, very expertise, uh, an M&A ex expert who's already applied uh, this model in the mental health space. So expect us to grow our clinic network both by M&A and by originating new clinics in new places. For people who are new to the, look, uh, I bet you they're gonna be, a, obviously, not I bet you, I guarantee you there are going to be a lot of new eyeballs because of this headline. So when they're discovering Novamind and they're discovering, they've all heard psychedelics, but they see, okay, Novamind's got clinics and they're, and they're, and they're dealing with 20,000 patients a year. So this is a serious group. Uh, can, you, can you kind of give a, an overview of the regulatory environment? How much does, how much do, do, does the law uh, you know, impact is it, man, is it legislated by states? Is it federal legislation? How much does the regulatory framework uh, impact your growth and your plan? Yeah, it matters. I mean, how much is a lot um, in, in which way gets, you know, pretty, you can get pretty granular on it. So um, I'll answer it this way. In terms of how we operate today, reminding people that we have a really robust business. It grew 100% year over year. We're expecting uh, coming out of COVID when, when people are, are freely moving, oh, demands yeah. even, you know going to be greater than that. Um, but that's because we use, uh, I've mentioned the, the alternative health modalities that are legally available today. We've made sure that we're experts in, in essentially all of them and provide them and have a lot of experience providing them. So I'd say you can think about it on a North American, European level, almost global, where you can, you can use ketamine. Uh, it's available everywhere. It's essentially legal everywhere. And it's, it's how we apply it using the therapeutic protocol and the type of integration where you get great results. Um, in term, so that's today, meaning there's no less than half a dozen alternative mental health modalities, including ketamine and different uses of ketamine, which you know, people don't fully understand, but at different dosages, you have what's called um, uh, uh, psycholytic or, or psychiatric use or psychedelic, as we've talked about. So there's different ways to use that drug. Uh, so no really restrictions and we can offer these things today and we do, uh, in any state, in, in any state. Yeah, absolutely. Any well, state. Much. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Ketamine, no. Absolutely. Um, when we look to the future, that's what we're really interested in. Of course, everybody's watching really closely. So, um, you have, uh, similar to what's going on in cannabis, you can see analogies on, on a policy level that you have state by state, uh, sort of fragmented view. Oregon seems, uh, set and, and will be the first, uh, it seems by far, to have a regulatory regime that lets people consume psilocybin in a regulated uh, infrastructure or environment, reg regulated policies around it, but legal. And other places have decriminalized, you know, bit by bit. So we basically, we, look, we watch the policy really carefully. We also deal very closely with insurance companies, given that, you know, let's say 80, 90% of our business is, is insurance-based, right? So we want to be showing uh, these insurance companies and we do uh, evidence-based examples of our evidence-based uh, protocols and su success we're having with clients. Um, that moves policy, it, it changes the economics, and of course it, it creates that accessibility, which is what we're, we're driving towards. Generally speaking though, the appetite for psychedelics, uh, both amongst the general public and within legislators around let's call this let's, let's talk about the us for now i would assume it's growing and if so what does that mean for nova mind over the next couple of years it means that um whether it was was luck or not we picked the right sector to build uh i don't a, think it was luck <laughs> no what you're doing there. um yeah you know but I, I guess in that part i'm trying to be a little bit humble about it because part of it is that um, we all, you know, my co-founders and I, and it's a big team now, it's, it's much more than, than me and, and people that started it. And there's a lot of very, very uh, significant brains in that brain trust now, but we all had our own motivations for getting 
getting into it and, and we want to build a very successful business for sure. We think it'll be really lucrative uh, for shareholders for sure. We think we're going to help a lot of people. So, um, you know, the, the motivations are many and building this thing is, uh, is not easy because it really is, some of it is unprecedented in terms of making it a lot easier for people to get uh, mental health care. And I think coming out of COVID, right, it, it, that, that's what I meant by the stuff that we could have never imagined. COVID, I, I don't wish, you know, obviously. Of course not. Sure. But the fact of the matter is COVID has created an incredible COVID is, is pretty good for our business. Um, it's exacerbated. I'll tell you, the, the, the best insight I can give you is that for sure is, is a CEO of a company that operates for these clinics now and is, you know, I've said publicly, we're going to double those clinics by end of year for sure. I think it'll be more than that. So the data, not, not what I see in the future, but the data I can tell you is that, you know, it's hundred percent year over year demand, but the more significant insight is that, you know, in, in terms of the stigma, um, and I think everyone can feel this and relate to it, that there's a softening of the stigma uh, around mental health and people are comfortable, my friends and my family and my colleagues and you and me, I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way that are touched by this. Um, it's no longer, you know, and, and people know this now when you, when you point it out, it's pretty obvious, but you know, when, when someone suffers from, um, you know, things, afflictions and diseases like cancer and heart disease and things, we really know how to respond uh, both culturally, emotionally, medically. Um, this is the reason for this paradigm shift. This is the reason it's not, it's not bullshit. There really is a, a systemic change that's necessary. You just need to, to know a few people in your life affected uh, by mental we health. We all need to know. So in that respect, to, to shine a light on it the way COVID does, to make everybody vulnerable about it, uh, makes, makes it a lot easier to bring new models of, of you know, care to the world yeah may, it, uh, covid might have provided some real short-term pain but if it really finally washed away the stigma where people just open themselves up say hey i'm suffering i need help and i i don't care to hide anymore then then long term the long-term benefits for society are fantastic and i can tell you that i have a client i have a client's mom both independently who shared stories with me and told me uh you know psychedelic ketamine microdosing in clinics here in Toronto and have just helped them enormously. Uh, so I'm already advocating when I speak to people who come to me and say they're, you know, they're, they're suffering from these things. Hey, you should consider going to a, uh, a clinic. So I think you guys are doing, uh, uh, I mean, anecdotally, last question is you're on, you really, you guys are really seeing some massive changes in people. Like people are really being helped uh, by, by psychedelics in, in, in your clinic specifically? The, the evidence of that, let's say, is it's amazing. So again, you're, in many cases, you're dealing with people who are uh, falling into that treatment-resistant category. And it, the numbers are huge, and the WHO reports on it, and it's really well understood. So in some cases, people are well-served by the standard of care, but in many, many cases, they're not. So the uh, impact, it's, it's very objective. If someone has suffered with the same type of condition for 10 or 20 years and you're able to effectively break that cycle again we're not offering a panacea and no one should look at, at, at any particular drug or the space in that respect that's also not to say that we're not looking for curative outcomes because that's what is really exciting if you look at things like mdma um, and the data that came from phase two and phase three it's absolutely curative, right? Someone was able to, to, to change their, their life so much or their condition changed so much that when compared to a scale before they were given that therapeutic, um, therapeutic alternative, it doesn't exist today. Um, they were on a scale that, that they don't fit in anymore in terms of qualifying their PTSD and face MDMA. So we, we see similar results with ketamine in particular indications. And when I mentioned earlier that we developed therapeutic protocols that's where you know that, that evidence is most exciting. So our practitioners, and we'll, we'll actually be doing some work in terms of, um, again, we, we, we're pretty under the radar, but case studies and highlighting for people, um, you know, what people's life was like before they came into one of our clinics, what their life was like after they were treated with one of our therapeutic protocols. Yeah, right. Again, just a little bit more accessible for everyone and relatable uh, so that we can, we can spread the word. I mean, treatment resistant depression. That sounds scary. It honestly does. And um, is that why treatment resistant depression is such an important area of research for your medical team? 
it is. Um, it is because it's it's the, the type of suffering that goes on around it is is pretty bad. Um, if people want to look into it, and uh, the other thing to be candid with you is that there's a, a very large commercial market. So when yeah, of course. you look at the largest drug developers, again, and we're not not a particularly a drug development business, but the people developing drugs are generally going to focus on the largest market sizes. Um, so that's why when you talk about 80 million people that aren't responding to a standard of care, it's a massive commercial opportunity yeah. there. It goes without saying. We take a view that, that you know, again, it's, it's also a um, so TRD gets a lot of attention because of that market size. Um, eating disorders and, and even palliative care for, for various reasons doesn't get the same amount of attention. So that's where we really focus our efforts in terms of the protocols we're developing. Uh, and you'll, you'll hear a lot more news from me. If all goes well, you're on when you look forward, because obviously, listen, you guys are real forward thinkers, so we're just speaking off the cuff here. But by the end of the decade, not by the end of this year or next year, do you see uh, mental health and society being much more under control or much more treatable just as a result of the growth in psychedelics and applications and clinics and, 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 uh, and research that the, the likes of Novomind are doing? I do. I, th I think you'll see, you know, see, I expect the world to change in a meaningful way in the sense that, uh, as you also know, the numbers associated with, with um, people that are essentially um, disabled, right, that can't work and that can't contribute to society in cases or can't fully because of these diseases. So what I do see is I see the data leading the way and I see that the that, that data and dollars move, move policy and and politicians and uh, in that environment where, uh, and again, some of what I'm saying is, is under, you know, it's remote, I should say all of what I'm saying is it's, it's understood um, by a lot of people. It's not original thinking, right? But you really have to look at it on a, on a level that is preventative and that is personalized. And it's very, very clear after, what is it? We're like half a century plus into the SSRI experiment you don't treat mental health with a one size fits all. It doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. It shouldn't work that way. Well, look, congratulations on a major milestone today. Uh, if there were shareholders in the smart, investors in the small cap market that didn't know about you and naturally they wouldn't, not everybody does. You're only, you've been, you've only been public for just over two months. Uh, you're definitely gonna get a lot of attention as a result of this. Uh, so congratulations on the milestone and look, Thank you. Uh, I think all shareholders would say amazing to have a company creating shareholder value and at the same time, amazing knowing uh, being a shareholder of a company that's creating societal value. So the fact that you're providing both ends of those is, is a pretty satisfying result. I appreciate it. I really do, George. And it's, it's early days. So, uh, you know, I mentioned all kinds of pipelines, but all, all the pipelines we have are deep. There's, there's only uh only opportunity for this company. So expect to hear a lot more. All right, and uh, we expect to have you back. Thanks for joining us today, uh, especially on a day like this where I'm sure the phone is ringing off the hook. Much yeah, my pleasure, they should all be days like this. What's that? It's that they should all be days like this. Well, if they're all days like this, then we wouldn't know if they're special or not at the end of the day, right? Fine by me. Thanks again, George. Yeah, thank you. For everybody at home, you've been watching or if you've been listening by, uh, by podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple, your favorite podcast platform, to Yaron Conforti, CEO, director, co-founder, which I think is really important for all of you to know, of Novamind. Trades on the CSC on the stock symbol NM, that's Nancy Mary Novamind. Uh, and for our friends in the U.S., NVMDF. We know that there's a lot to absorb here. You can't absorb all of it. No way. We don't. I, I certainly am not able to. So the next part is to continue doing your due diligence. So make sure you get to the Nova Mine Hub and Agoracom. Take a look at the materials we've got there because what, what we've done is try and break this all down into layman terms and layman explanations and make it easy for you to get a really good understanding of the company. Once you've done that, you've got a really comfortable understanding then make sure you link right over the Novamind site straight from Agoracom to do an even deeper dive uh, into, the, into the company because psychedelics are here to stay. Novamind's already executing. Uh, there's a bright future ahead for both of those. Uh, and hopefully you discovered your next great small cap company. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. See you next time.